customers. I built an e-hub and I had a back channel. It all helped out very well. Then our board can't provide enough e-learning options to offer the full range of courses and new courses that are available for our students. So doesn't it make sense then that we have all of these boards and they're all offering e-learning courses? Why don't we dissolve the boundaries and allow our students to, because it is virtual, to take courses outside of their own board? And so now it opens up an entire world and menu of courses so that students are able to a great a lot of flexibility flexibility and being able to adapt their timetable to match their particular pathway, destinations, interests, etc. So it's been fantastic that way. Uh, the other perspective we talked about increasing course options and flexibility, but also boards FTE and funding. So you're probably thinking, well, how does e-learning impact full-time equivalent status and, and funding? Well, it reduces the number of part-time students. So when you look at a board and you know board if it's a student in course, it costs that it's a part time student, it only takes the student to start with money for that student. But what if that student is doing three courses or four courses and now it's designated a full time student? And often uh, and then the board can receive full funding for that particular student. So uh, by dissolving the boundaries, offering more course options, allowing students access to courses that are being developed and run by other boards. You may be moving a number of students from part time status to full time status. The whole idea is that, you know, this is not new. And uh, in Ontario, there is dissolved boundaries with regard to even if you're not a member of, the, of any of our consortia, for you to be able to take courses at a board. However, we do it based on a balance, what we call a traffic balance. We've got a very complex you know, system that works in the background, I'll talk about it in a moment, that actually keeps track of our balance. What I mean by that is, we don't have any movement of money. So if I was a student who was in a board that wasn't a part of the board, and I needed a particular converted course that wasn't off of the board, I'd have to go to the board to get it. Well, to go to the board to get it, I may be, I think at one point I will remove from the site, the uh, ministry suggested an invoice for the $740 to go back to the other board. So now you have invoicing, you have the tracking of money and whatnot. So it gets to be a little complicated. Now, absolutely, of course. But what if you were able to negate that? What if you were able to balance the number of students that are actually going to your board and taking courses outside of your board with the number of out of board students taking your courses? Well, then it's a lot. And there's no reason to be, there's no reason for you then to have to do the invoicing and tracking of money. So that's one of the other premises on which we'll go. And then the fact is, is that I was a adult. I was a, uh, a vice principal responsible for e-learning. And what I recognize is that all boards are doing the same thing. We've got wonderful leadership, incredible resources that are being provided by the Ministry of Education, particularly TILO. But all boards are following the same processes and having to develop, implement things in-house. Doesn't it make sense for us to, instead of working in these silos, to pull all of that and work on it collaboratively? To share all of these things that we're doing. So we pool our expertise, our best practices, the tools that we develop, the resources that we develop, and we take a collaborative approach. And that, of course, intensifies what our efficiency and the impact we have. So I just threw up a couple of examples actually just a few moments ago. We all hire and train our e-teachers. <laughs> so rather than developing a program and a process, each individual board, we do that collaboratively, or we have some boards that have pivoted out of the park in terms of how they do this. So that would be a best practice, and we're all able to, because we're a part of the consortium, we dissolve those boundaries, we have an equal sharing, we meet regularly, we have facilities in order to share these things and communicate, we're able to uh, benefit from the work of one another. So now all of a sudden that particular DELT, you know, like Sean Hamilton here, great DELT with Upper Grant, instead of him having to develop all those things in isolation, as a part of the consortium, he's able to take advantage of the work that's already been done and then be able to manipulate it, uh, be able to adapt it to his own needs and his own work. We all build, promote, and implement our, our programs. <laughs> I think I should do this program and program. So, our processes and programs. We all have to communicate with stakeholders, guidance counselors, parents, students, senior administration. You know, the list goes on and on. So, if there's a system, Ottawa Catholic developed three systems for us. Got, got picked up by many of our member boards. Rather than developing in isolation, it's already done. 
you take that particular process protocol program and you uh, develop it for your own needs. The biggest part is extract and report data. So with everything that we do in the consortium is very heavily data driven. And a lot of that data comes from the system that we have built that aligns with our, um, our student information systems which I'll talk about in a moment. Four programs, we have our regular day uh, program, so that's how it started. And that's been our most popular program until recently. Summer school e-learning is actually very close to our enrollment now in our regular day school program. Well, why is that? The fact is, is I'm going to use a very quick story. Randy loves stories. I'm talking about my son. My son's name is Christian. Chris is uh, 18 and I headed out to Ottawa to do commerce. Chris, uh, Chris has always been a big football and hockey player in school, but also very interested in grammar, student government, and those types of things. He was finding it very hard in order to put his timetable together so that he would still have time for his sports, which were very intensive, the time that he missed at school, his time to take those optional courses like grammar, and the time for you know, student government, those types of things. And so he reached ahead and started doing his Englishes, his ENG3U, he did after grade 10, his ENG4U, he did after grade 11. So he was able to now free up his timetable so that he was able to take part in some of those elective courses. So summer school e-learning, not necessarily for people who, it's not always people who have failed courses or people who are repeating courses to bring their grade up. A lot of the times it's for people who are reaching ahead so that they're able to manipulate their timetable to get the time that they need. And in Chris's case, missing a lot of school for, for athletics, e-learning helps. Gave him that, that spare that he needed. And also, it allowed him a couple of spots where he could plug in optional courses. This is huge for us now. I'm so glad she looked sort of the, the gentleman who asked the question in the back. Adult Ed, yes, we are doing that. We are a consortium where we have begun last year with uh, we've got some Rod Gilmore is here somewhere, Chris Khalil here in the back. We've got a fantastic program over at Algonquin Lakeshore Catholic. There's other member boards, and my apologies for not mentioning you all, who already have adult e learning programs running. Kilo has taken it on and is starting to write catered content that's specifically related to andragogy, not just revising the existing courses which we've tried to do in the past. So the adult education hybrid courses, so they're being developed in-house. That's the other thing about the consortium is because they're being developed in-house, we're able to share them and we have a facility for that. We're sharing them with the rest of the uh, consortium. For them to vet using their own processes, we never pass on a course and say, here, give it to your teacher. We pass on a course, say, I will, we have a facility for sharing the courses, make sure you put it through your own rigorous reviews at your at the board level before you can pass it on to the teacher. Okay. And a lot of the stuff is very similar to the, the rigorous review process that uh, Kilo uses. And then we have some credit recovery online become big and FAR programs have become uh, popular online as well. And so we've delved into that and working very closely. We just finished working on a project with Kespa with getting uh, some of the prior assessments online. So what do we share? We share a bunch of things. We share our offerings. We share students, of course. Most importantly, folks, is we have what's called the SSDS. It's the Student Success Needs Solution. We use it for registration, communication, tracking, reporting. And it's a very powerful remote database that we can ask questions to and provide us the data that we need to inform, reflect the effectiveness of our practices and inform our decisions. <laughs> and that's my, yeah, so that was my timer. I don't want to, so the, uh, the rest of the things, obviously, you know, is with the sharing. And we, we do have a governing council, and I don't want to be remiss. And we have a new chair of our governing council. Our governing council has uh, one senior administrator from each one of our school boards who sits on who dictates all of our directives. And then we have an operational group that's more procedural. And where's Hannah Wilson? Hannah's not here anymore. Oh, Hannah was back here anyway. So Hannah is, uh, so uh, we got our WordPress site. Some of our numbers, if you're, if you're interested in how big we are, uh, this is how many we put through e-learning. This is just regular e-learning last year. Notice how much we're growing each and every year. 22% of our students are at board students. Look at how much growth we've had in summer school all the way up to almost 9,000 now. 21% at a board students taking advantage of school supports being offered by other boards. Look at our, what our, our medians are and our pass rates. So 80, 82% medians, 92% pass rates, and still rigorous courses. 
So lots of great supports. Uh, challenges and successes. Here's our successes. I've already talked about a lot of these things, but I want to talk about our challenges for just one moment. Large wait lists, because I know that this is going to be talked about with the other consortium. Large wait lists, you saw it in our last slide. Enormous wait lists that continue to grow. We're doing a much better job in terms of trying to reduce those wait lists. I work very closely with boards in providing the data that they need and the process that they need in order to select the courses that they should be offering, as well as ensuring that those wait lists are accurate. High attrition. You know, it's still a problem in e-learning for you in, uh, in high schools in Ontario, and it's often due to enrollment practices. So students will sign up for a course in February that they may not be doing for the following February. And oftentimes, the guidance counselor may put them in, on the wait list for four e-learning courses, hoping that they get into one. What happens is, is they may get accepted into multiple courses, and now the teacher has to play the cat and mouse game for the two weeks. The student's not logging in. And we have, they were not allowed as administrators, you can't take a student out of the course until they've been absent for 15 days. 15 days goes by, unfortunately, haven't been able to make contact, haven't been able to get a response from the guidance counselor or the parents or the students, and we got uh, automated messages that go to all of them. So now we finally removed them from the list, but it's too late to add a student from that wait list. So now our classes go from you know, 31, which is that cap, they may now drop down to 27, 28, still may have a lot of students on the wait list. So there's things we're doing about that as well. The adult thing, the whole, the current registers for adult education funding models, the fact that we're trying to offer quality online education, often using the correspondence register and that funding model, and it's very difficult. So I'm looking forward to some of those presentations. And then uh, still those courses that require written final exam, trying to get those facilitated and proctored around the province. That's it for that. So that was, ooh, that was quick. And uh, I then the uh, slide deck will be available online uh, when we get there. So we're going to turn it over to Michael from uh, OCELC. Good job, Todd. Thank you. So another acronym to put into your giver OCALC. OCALC. How many are here for the first time for a candy learn event? Wow, three quarters of you, that's fantastic. I'm included in that. Really excited to be here. I'm really glad that uh, Randy's able to put this together. Fantastic. I'll, I'll, I'll be more, not, not me, no, that's a side statement. Just not me, I'll okay. apologize. And so um, coordinator then of the Oak Health, and um, a lot of the challenges that the father <coughs> mentioned, uh, we face as well, so I'm not gonna reiterate those. Um, we've been uh, in existence since uh, 2010, 29 Catholic school boards are part of the consortium. And uh, if you could go ahead there, one, two, it's all on two slides. Oh, the two slides, okay. You cut me back already? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, primary purpose is to provide equity access to Catholic secondary students, it's again, to take, give them choice, student choice. Um, consortium members, again, again, collaborate to enhance opportunities uh, to improve student success. Governance, we have a steering committee, um, opposed to myself. We have uh, the Telps who are part of that uh, committee as well as superintendents from a variety of different uh, school districts. So good representation there in terms of, uh, you know, coordinating the decision-making for, uh, for our consortium. Uh, my role is a part-time role. And uh, I'd like to say to Todd that I can do things in less time than him, obviously. If he needs more time to, <laughs> as a full-time coordinator. Um, but I actually have another hat. I, I do uh, presentations in uh, schools um, for students, parents, and teachers on creating a positive digital footprint. So that's the other hat that I wear, another passion of mine. Um, in terms of uh, you know my my position, much wider than that, but that's just kind of a snapshot of uh, making sure that I'm supporting uh, the Phelps. That's probably the biggest part of my role, making sure there's access to uh, for students to, to a wide range of courses via the uh, so we the SRS, the seat reservation system, um, the ministry seat reservation system, hosting and sharing courses via, via that system. Um, from, the, from inception, you know, one of the expectations is that, in Todd references, that there would be a balance, right? Or that the boards have, have uh, you know. <laughs> Be able to offer at least one course when we started out. That was the expectation. 
2010 that at the end of the year, that this uh, peace board um, could offer one course where, where again, we could have this uh, you know, potential sharing of students. Um, last few years, consortium members have offered close to 100 courses on an annual basis, um, again, via the, uh, via the SRS. So, you know, I, th I think probably one of the biggest things for me is being able to network with different organizations. Kilo has been incredibly instrumental in, uh, in shaping a lot of what I do. I, I was a classroom teacher, a technology coordinator for the Waterloo Catholic District School Board, and uh, e-learning contact, which are now TELPS. And so um, they kind of drove e-learning, have been the main driver, um, both e-learning of course in the province, and ignited my passion around the whole, the whole issue of, uh, of, of online learning. So these are the partners, right? It's all about professional learning, meeting and networking opportunities, such as we have here today. And uh, of course, going forward, um, I created uh, last year the uh, annual OCA forum, where again, I bring in the uh, TELPS to, to share best practices with the TELPS to share what they're doing around the province. And, and, and as, as I said, Tilo has done a tremendous job of creating this infrastructure for us to leverage. And um, I mean, even though they've done that, they're of course, they face, of course, budget constraints as well, as, as uh, we do, consortiums. And so I see us as filling the gaps, so to speak, some of those gaps by supporting um, the people on the front lines, the people um, you know, in the role of coordinating learning teachers at those various systems, of course, with helps. And of course, networking with, with Can He Learn, um, which has just been recent for our consortia. Our consortium um, has been, I, I think, a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I'm going to leave a question with you because I want to give uh, ample time for Paul and, and my uh, colleague to speak as well. Um, is to think about how perhaps the consortiums right, can help you in whatever role that you have, and in particular the, the TELS. What can we do to continue to support you and your role, but also to benefit students. That's why we're all here together. That's why every group is here. That's hopefully why everyone is here. The ultimate um, glue holding all of this together is the student, and enhancing student learning and technology-enabled learning, which we won't call technology-enabled learning after a few years, right? It's all going to be learning. At least I hope it is. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity. Again, Randy, for, for coordinating this, uh, this incredible summit. And um, think about that question. Jump into the uh, Google document with ideas. And uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Paul uh, Agent Hamoud et uh, French Language Consortium, le Consortium de l'apprentissage virtuel de langue française de l'Ontario. That's the, the French Language Consortium that was created by the 12 French Language School Board back in 2010 to be able to, uh, to offer, start with the offer online learning courses to uh, our French language students in our high school. Now, we, we, we started planning all of this back in 2006, just before the ministry came out with the e-learning initiative. We were thinking, talking about that and we were trying to look at ways of solving problems because as, as others have mentioned, you know, small high schools, now they can't offer all those programs. Kids, uh, uh, they, they can't have it here. They decide to go elsewhere and we need kids. And how, how can we do that? How can we offer a full high school, uh, full high school uh, curriculum to, uh, to, to our 12 students, because we have high school, but that could be a town of 12 students, or, or a high school as big as 1,200 students. Boards that have one high school and boards that have 10, 12 high schools. So th there were big challenges at that time when we started thinking about the consortium and how we can, how, how we can make it work. What will it look like? And one of the most important things that came out also from the director of education and high schools, the principals, and others is it has to be a win-win situation. And win-win for some meant, well, 
system, how can we make it work so that I don't lose full time equivalent studio? How can I make it so that it doesn't cost me an enormous an amount of dollars because schools are taking online courses that are offered by another high school that an, uh, an online teacher that is elsewhere in the province, elsewhere in another board. So all of these questions were around there when we decided to look into it, delve into that, and try to come up with, with a model. And basically, we came up with a consortium that was created between 2006 and 2010. We have a little pilot project that's going on because the ministry, with our other partners, uh, C Corp and others, they're, they're creating the online courses, we're getting those resource materials out there for us. So we decided to get something started, a pilot project with the C Corp and offer online courses. Every board had chipped in an online teacher and we started that project earlier on and then still working on creating this model. I'm sorry, I'm having it, having it uh, come up online in uh, February of 2010. Basically, and uh, our mandate, yes, we are there to offer online high school courses, day courses for the students, for the high school students of Ontario. Uh, we now, and we have been offering since 2011, our summer program. And, uh, and we've, uh, we offer a guidance, uh, a guidance counseling service to all of our high schools also, uh, because on our staff, we have a full-time guidance counselor. Uh, we have kids coming from all of the high schools, so some of them, uh, some between 11 and 14% of the kids enrolled uh, each semester are kids with special needs. So we have a full-time uh, resource teacher, a special education resource teacher that, that helps out, uh, helps the online teachers and works closely with the home the students homeschool on staff. And uh, we were asked also, uh, in the last this last time of us to work closely and start establishing partnerships with our post-secondary partners, uh, French language partners in Ontario. And that's another piece that came on board in 2000, uh, 2015. And the last part, which is the Con Ed part, and Jean-Pierre Brulette, my uh, colleague is here with us today, uh, came on board in 2015. He picked up the summer program because it had started in 2011. It was growing very fast. Big enrollments and it was sucked out about what, 700 we had this summer? 700 students taking online courses. So that, that part too had been growing very quickly. And he picked up the, the, the whole piece on the continuing education and adult education. has been working very closely with the full board, establishing partnerships and uh, basically Simply like directing adults that are interested in continuing, you know, completing their high school diploma, getting the that extra credit they need for a program or whatnot, and working with them and sending them, getting them to to take on uh, to have an online course with one of our 12 school boards that offer that offer these courses. I think uh, Todd, you were talking about that and the, having a specialist teacher in there. Well, that collaboration we started in 2015. Uh, we had what we call the Comité de Mise en Oeuvre, which is like the uh, implementation committee, which, which has basically evolved over the years. It's sort of a, an advisory board. It's a, it's a management board. It's composed of one representative of each school board. And what's nice is that we meet with them about six times a year, and they, have the, they are the eyes and ears of the directors of education. So whatever initiatives we work on, we can vet them with them, we can prepare them, we exchange the information, we keep them informed of what we're going, what we're doing, where we're going, and they they have they can link with their directors of education. That that committee is uh, we've had that, that committee and they, they assure this liaison between the consortium and the school board. We have well our provincial partners, the three main provincial partners. We work closely with Nathalie and Naomi and Martin in Ottawa from the Ministry of Education. On the resource side with the CPORT, the Centre Transfrontalier de Ressources Pédagogiques, uh, for the resources, and we're there for the online programs. For our students, we've added uh, quite a few courses. We're offering them this year, we'll be offering them five, 105 different online courses. We've added in the last few years quite a few interesting courses. Some of them of you were here yesterday were able to see, uh, well, 
the phys ed courses that we're, that the brand new phys ed courses that are coming out. We have uh, music, uh, media arts, uh, visual arts, uh, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. We'll just 105 courses. As a high school principal, I love this because instead of saying, well, I, I, I'll offer you in school, you know, 40, 35, 40, I've got a very small high school, I'll offer you maybe, what, maybe 30 courses and whatnot. No, I tell my community, I can offer you 105 courses, a full curriculum. Why? Because I'm one of the schools in that consortium and I can get this and students can have their online course and their online experiences through the, through the school, which is quite nice. Just a quick view, that's our staff. We have 20, 24 teachers on, 22 online, uh, 22 online teachers for the secondary panel. And we've uh, been uh, running a pilot project for grade eight students to be able to have this online learning experience. And we have two online teachers for that project. And we've added another teacher uh, last semester, second semester for the, uh, for the uh, phys ed program that came online. What we do, it's all for the kids. So, and, and the voice of the students so, is so important so that we, we have mechanisms that uh, give us the opportunity to survey at the end of each semester to, to get some information, get, the, get the, the kids' voice back to us on their learning experience through the semester. And surveys also for our school partners, high school principals, uh, guidance counselors, uh, the uh, the, on, uh, the supervisory teacher in the school that uh, takes care of the students. And, and we've uh, came up this year and we've, had, uh, we've added a, uh, a survey for the parents also. And all of this information gives us good data that helps us each, at the end of each semester and each year to be able to, okay, what, was the, what, what did we do well? What went well? What has to be improved? What changes can we make? What projects can we, you know, what little projects can we, implement make the learning experience the best that it could be for the students and uh, we've been uh, over the years we've been uh, able of uh, collecting enormous amount of data that has helped us just make it a better program for all of our kids uh, just a quick view uh, of the growth over the years we we at the beginning of the consortium we had 15 teachers we're up to 22, 23 now. We'll have to update this, uh, this for the second semester last year. But uh, in, in growth rate, 23 percent. Uh, the number of online courses at that time was 95. We haven't added 10 over the, the last uh, semester. We're up to a you know, growth of 83 percent. The number of students uh, that complete their courses. Uh, this is the number of students who started with 790, 1077, the growth of 26 percent. And the number, we didn't have numbers uh, when we started for those with IEPs, but last uh, first semester of last year, 107 students with IEPs, and so uh, and it's been uh, the the success rates of the kids is very good because of the the work that is being done by the homeschool to make sure that the kid has all the resources and the support needed to be able to follow the online course, and the great communications between the teacher. And that supervisor, the online teacher and the supervising teacher in the school, and the consortium working with the high schools and their success teams and everything to make sure that the learning experience for the student is a very positive one. And at the end, the students succeed. Uh, I'm just looking at the time, which is just about the end of it before the break. I know that I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the other programs. Um, okay, I'll just pass over these. Okay. Uh, Challenges, uh, Todd referred to the famous waiting list. Yes, we do have waiting lists in, uh, since uh, the second semester of 2011. We've, we've been having waiting lists. Now for the last two and a half years, every semester, all of our courses, we have waiting lists for them. And we're trying to find ways to, to um, uh, offer an alternative to our students. The summer courses program is, is incredible because that's one also that has grown very, very fast over the years. And that, that has helped for students that were not able to take their regular online courses with the consortium. They can do it during the summer. But now we're looking at other alternatives. We're working closely with John Scott and Sean Ed and see 
what creative ways can you do? What what can you do to help the students? We found quite a few ways. We've been able to help what about close to 60, 70 students uh, uh, the last semester just to be able to get their online course because they needed to complete their diploma or whatnot. So this is an interesting, interesting aspect. I'm stopping there because that, that's one of the challenges. The other one is, well, it's becoming tougher now because uh, there's a little bit of a um, teacher shortage in the French language school. So we're, we're, we're going through these difficult times trying to find people that the boards aren't always willing to let people come and be seconded to the construction for their for online courses because they need their staff in their school. So this is another challenge we, the, this year that we started to struggle with and try to find solutions. So that's, these are the two big challenges that we have right now. How to manage the growth and what do we do in a time of uh, teacher shortages also. Uh, there are other good pieces on the uh, slide deck that will be available and I'll have a a simplified uh, English version for everyone, but uh, and it's, uh, I'll be available because there are lots of good stuff to, with our uh, grade eight program and our partnership with post secondary that we've been doing now for the last few years. So that's it. Uh, I'll uh, let thanks, thanks, Bob. To you. Yeah, and.